All right. Well, good day, everyone. We want to welcome you to PrimePay's monthly broker series webinars. Uh, today's webinar is entitled, It's the Final Countdown, um, Preparing for the New Overtime Rule Requirement. Yes, folks, we're about six weeks out from this requirement, and uh, we wanted to share uh, the highlights, but also some strong practical application for you to have a better understanding of this rule and how your clients, your employers will need to comply with this new requirement. So we are thrilled to have you today. Uh, your time is valuable. It is uh, one of the busiest times of the year. So we are very thankful that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to sit with us today. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Steve Jackson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Development and Channel Sales here at PrimePay. And uh, again, we're, we're thrilled that you were able to join us on this very important topic uh, here today. Uh, let me first go over some of the logistics, the ground rules of our webinar. Uh, we've got a lot of folks on the call here today. And so your lines are muted. Um, but don't be sad about that. Uh, we still want to hear from you. Uh, we have a special guest speaker here today. And the, I know <laughs> that there will be questions that you want to ask. And we want to hear from you. So if you would, please go into the GoToMeeting menu bar. There's a question box there. Uh, you can type in your question um, and go ahead and click your question, submit it to us. And then we will uh, make every attempt throughout the webinar here today today to answer your question. Um, uh, most of the general questions we're going to be able to answer here today for you, but if you have a specific, maybe legal or a little more personal type of question, we will get to you offline and answer your question in that regard. One of the key questions that we get most often uh, is, are we recording the session? Are we going to be able to get a copy of the presentation, the slide deck? that we're presenting here today? So the answer is yes and yes. Uh, we, we are recording the sessions. We do uh, put these or upload these directly onto our Broker Concierge YouTube channel. And um, that's generally posted within two days um, after the webinar. So in our follow-up uh, uh, email to you, uh, we will be providing information on where you can find that. Also on the presentation itself, um, this is an exclusive uh, for our broker concierge partners. Um, we will be posting the presentation directly into the broker portal, our community portal, that you can view then at your leisure. So uh, please, uh, if you are unfamiliar with what our broker concierge partner program is all about, you can certainly reach out to us here after the webinar for more details. So with that, why don't we get started? Um, you know, it is the final countdown, folks. We have six weeks before this important requirement goes into effect. And uh, we want to make sure that as a benefits consultant, as a broker, as an advisor, that you have the information that you need to be able to fully assist, um, support, and, and provide practical application for your employers, ultimately driving some strong value-added solutions uh, for your clients. But before we get started, I want to make an introduction. We have a very um, a special guest here today. Um, we have, uh, and I want to introduce, uh, Robert Bob Small, um, Esquire. He is the partner at Rieger Rizzo Darnall LLP. And he is a partner in the Labor and Employment and Corporate and Business Services Groups in the firm's Philadelphia office. Bob has counseled individuals and businesses for more than 30 years with regard to business matters that include employment law, transactional matters, and business succession planning, and has litigated those matters in state and federal court throughout the United States. In addition to large law firm experience, Bob has served as assistant general counsel to two Fortune 500 companies, and as such is sensitive, very sensitive, to the needs of corporate law departments to control outside legal costs. Bob writes extensively. Um, we, if we had time, we'd go through a lot of it, um, some great stuff. But he writes about employment law matters, and he also lectures to lawyers and human resources professionals on developments in employment law. Uh, Bob is here today to show, um, to kind of share his experience um, of this important uh, rule and requirement. Uh, we want to ensure that your clients are ultimately fulfilling their obligation uh, to this requirement. And, and Bob, we are thrilled to have you here today for you to share that knowledge and experience with uh, these brokers and benefits consultants. So thank you for attending today. Thank you, Steve. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate. Welcome to all our, our listeners. 
Uh, you've certainly chosen a timely topic. Uh, employers with exempt employees are going to have a, a life-changing moment on December 1st. And hopefully today we can uh, walk our listeners through the minefield the government has set out for them uh, safely. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob. Um, what, let's go over the agenda here then uh, here today. Um, it, we have, we're going to base a, a large part of our webinar today in a uh, question and answer session here with Bob. Uh, we have laid out several questions that are very much uh, the, one, some of the most common, but also the, the questions that are probably, maybe they're keeping your employers up at night <laughs> to some degree, and we want to provide some practical application to that. So a good part of that will be this practical knowledge training uh, with Bob here today. But I, in the in the early going here, I want to try to provide some basics. Maybe some of you are not as familiar with uh, these overtime rules. So I want to ensure that you understand which employers um, are, you know, are needing to comply uh, with this rule. I, I want to share briefly what those current rules are, but also in six weeks, what are the new rules? What do they look like? Okay. And then we'll spend some time in the Q&A session to really provide recommendations for your clients and and really preparing them for the next steps. I do want to say here, too, as part of our disclaimer, legal disclaimer, that this webinar is for informational purposes only, uh, you know, does not constitute any legal advice. Uh, but we just ask that you or certainly your client seek professional help, you know, certainly for specific legal opinions that, that you require or your clients require. So let's kind of jump into a pretty heavy slide here. Some of you might say, Steve, come on, you're starting it with you're starting the presentation here with this slide. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to, because you know what? The changes that we're about to discuss will not only heighten kind of the employee awareness about overtime rights, right? I mean, as this information gets out to existing employees, they're going to understand more about their overtime rights than maybe what they've experienced or have known in the past. But it's also going to entitle more employees to overtime, okay, which, which creates that not only the need to fulfill or comply with the requirement, but also that liability aspect as well. So prior to these changes being finalized, overtime lawsuits had already doubled between 2005 to 2015, and they are expected to increase by 8 to 10% in 2000, uh, 2017 alone. In a report, in a recent report from management side firm Seafarth Shaw LLP, it shows that 2015 hit another record year for wage and hour filings and came with the result of all-time high settlement numbers. Given this trend uh, that has really been going on over the last dozen years, employers can expect to see record-breaking FLSA filings in 2016. Because you know what? The Department of Labor's final rules here um, only widens the area of liability for companies. This, this report from CFARS Shaw also emphasized that, empl that employers can prepare for another year of lawsuit risk by doing in-depth assessments. See, they need to actually do assessments to determine their exposure to issues such as misclassification of employees or of overtime eligible workers as, as exempt. You know, we've talked over the last uh, couple webinars um, in regard to classification of employees. You know, as it relates to FLSA, you know, there's a huge discussion around W-2 employees and 1099 employees. It's going to be still a very strong push to ensure that, that that is being classified correctly within every organization. But you guys also need to think about classification of employees as well, and it's different for the Affordable Care Act, you know, classifying employees as full-time, as part-time, as variable hour employees, seasonal, and so forth. So please keep that in mind. I've mentioned how important that is, but the classification of employees as you're talking with your clients is so vastly important here, uh, and certainly to this new rule and this require or the expansion, really, of this requirement. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar here is, is going to get a workout <laughs> based on this new requirement. Uh, the Department of Labor estimates that employers will spend $592 million to comply with this new overtime ruling. So that's, that is drastic, all right, and something that your employers are going to have to consider, not only in that preparation, but also that continual, um, um, you know, in fulfilling that obligation and complying with it on an ongoing basis. 
So first, what I want to uh, just mention here, or at least kind of touch on some of the basics, um, is am I an exempt employer? You know, it's good to know and, and have an understanding who is covered under, and, and you've heard me say FLSA, uh, but that is the Federal Labor Standards Act. And so you need to have an understanding of which employers actually would fall, you know, under this, under this ruling. So there is kind of, I'll call it, this, this first step of compliance is knowing <laughs> whether you're exempt as an employer or not. Um, you know, as, as we've talked about the Affordable Care Act over the last couple of years, you know, we focused heavily about, you know, whether you're the determination of whether you're an applicable large employer or not, right? Even in the last webinar we provided, it, I really tried to make a note that your employers may be confused <laughs> in, in determining whether they are or do fit under that definition or not. So it is important to know kind of who fits uh, under this requirement. And you're going to see here with this definition that it, it's, it's going to cover um, the vast majority of employers out there today. So just some key bullets here. The annual gross volume of sales made or business done by an employer uh, would be at least $500,000. So their annual gross sales volume um, is, is $500,000 or more, or at least $500,000. Employees, they would also then, those employers would have employees regularly involved with interstate commerce or the production of goods for commerce. So as you think about that particular definition, that certainly um, is very broad, but is going to encompass um, very much a majority of employers out there today. And then employers that just, are. Oh, go ahead. If Bob. I could just jump in on that on that one point, so people understand the the broad scope of interstate commerce. An employee who looks at, licks a stamp and places it on an envelope that's going to go from one state to another is engaged in interstate commerce. So it's a very <laughs> broad standard that almost every employer who has five hundred thousand dollars of sales is going to. Uh, <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you, Bob. And then, and then lastly, that's a very good point, just licking a stamp. Unbelievable. <laughs> so employers that are under FLSA, kind of regardless of the above then, is generally going to fit into uh, these categories, hospitals, medical or nursing care uh, entities, uh, schools, and public agencies. And so, um, you know, the reach is very broad here, and I would say that there would be very few entities, certainly those that are under 500,000, that um, would be exempt. Um, from this existing rule. So what are the current rules? Let's briefly get a solid understanding of the existing rules because this will help prepare you for the new ones that are coming here in six weeks. So FLSA requires that employers pay all non-exempt employees overtime pay, right? Time and a half in essence. Um, so employers are going to have to pay all non-exempt employees overtime pay. So, so what is that kind of look like here. So we need to ensure and understand who is exempt, who's not exempt. So employees are exempt if they have fixed compensation, right? They have a salary. Um, you're paying them that fixed compensation base uh, for what they what they ultimately work. Um, and, uh, you know, you see that a lot with sales professionals and, and management um, executives and so forth. But they have a fixed compensation. They earn a salary of at least $23,660 or $455 per week. Uh, that is the current threshold. Um, for those exemptions. They also need to complete duties that are primarily either executive, administrative, or professional. And we're going to go into just a little more detail in, in our question and answer session with Bob in regard to what exactly those things are. But they need to complete those duties. And then lastly, employees are exempt if they are considered a highly compensated employee that has a threshold of $100,000. Okay, so those are the, the current rules that are out there. And as you look at the current salary level update, um, you know, here uh, for the current thresholds, this was originally set in 2004. So it's been a long time and actually very much needed to have an update here at this time because as you see in the, in the visual, you know, you're looking at the poverty line um, of most folks here today in 2016, and this isn't even coming close. Um,
needs to be in regard to assisting um, you know individuals and families uh, certainly with the existing threshold so this was set in 2004 lastly and again the current level is four hundred and fifty five dollars per week or twenty three thousand six sixty per year so the next kind of question as we think about kind of these current requirements are, you know, are my clients, so your clients there, are, your, are, those, are their employees exempt? And there's actually three tests that determine if an employee is exempt or not exempt. So if an employee does not exceed the guidelines set forth by all three of these tests, then they are exempt and therefore are covered by the FLSA. In other words, if you fail one, you are protected by the FLSA. So these three tests are, one, the salary basis test. And what that salary basis test, just you know, briefly, is the employee must be paid on a salary basis, not subject to a reduction based on quality or quantity of work. Okay, so basic salaried individual kind of definition, so salary basis. Salary level test states that this is where it focuses on the threshold. The amount of salary paid must meet a minimum salary level, which again is currently at $455 per week, $23,660 annually. And then lastly, under the job duties, there is a duties test where the employee's job duties must primarily involve exempt executive, administrative, or professional responsibilities. And just to note, um, you know, this duties test, even though we have new requirements here uh, coming forth here 12.1, there was no update um, to the existing duties test and duties definition. Steve, if I can again jump in, there is a fourth exempt classification of, of employees, and that would be computer employees. And I, I'll touch on that a little bit later, but there is a fourth qualified uh, group that are exempt. Fantastic. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. All right, so what is changing? Real quick here as far as what is changing. So December 1st, so this rule was announced here Monday, uh, May 23rd of this year, and it comes into effect, uh, this requirement to be uh, fulfilled here as of December 1st of this year. So what is changing? Well, one, uh, which is was very much needed, was a new salary level update, so a new threshold. So again, this is effective December 1st, 2016, and it moved that line from that 400 55 a week, okay, number, to now $913 per week or $47,476 per year. All right, so you can see the difference. Um, you know, after, you know, 12 years, yeah, this was indeed uh, needing an update and for it to be amended. Some other key changes uh, that are made is that the threshold was raised for the highly compensated employees uh, to an amount of $134,004. Um, the duties test, as I had mentioned, kind of remain the same, and they plan on auto-adjusting um, these uh, thresholds for the highly compensated and, and uh, for the regular salary threshold will just every three years, uh, beginning in 2020. Other pay incentive, one of the other um, kind of new uh, pieces detail in regard to this requirement was also centered around other pay. So really kind of focused on incentive, bonus types of, of structures. So the final rule will allow up to 10% of the salary threshold for non-highly compensated employees to be met by a non by non-discretionary bonuses, incentive pay, or commissions, provided that these payments are made on at least a quarterly basis. All right, this is a new policy. Um, they had responded to um, a tremendous amount of kind of comments, public comments in relation to this that they received from kind of all across the country. And so this is why this was added into this requirement here as of December 1st. Um, so um, this, is, this is new. It carries a lot of uh, some confusion. One of the questions that I will ask Bob is centered around this, so I know we'll go into a little more detail here with this. Uh, but Bob, I don't know if you had any other comments just in relation to this at this time. No, I think I'll wait and we'll, we'll cover it as we plan a little later on. Okay, very good. All right, so, so another key just point is as you think about your role with your clients, is you might say, well, 
all right, I mean, is it is it affecting all my clients? Well, the answer is yes. This is affecting virtually all of your clients in some form or fashion. But understand kind of the broader scope. These overtime updates, this kind of expansion, uh, will extend protections to up to 4.2 million workers. And I've just highlighted here five states um, where you see its impact is going to be probably at its greatest or affect uh, the most amount of workers. In California and Texas, uh, we've got close to 400,000, 350 to 400,000 workers um, that um, this particular overtime rule will extend to. That's not a bad thing, but it's certainly a, 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 an obligation that this employer needs to uh, review comprehensively to ensure that they're going to be complying with this new rule. So very important. All right, so let's go ahead. Um, now that I've kind of laid a little bit of the foundation of some of the rules, um, I've, I've, we've given Bob here some questions here that we feel would help you best address key questions um, and obligations with your clients and to do it on a much more practical matter. So these were just questions, and as we go along here, we're going to take some questions. Uh, let me remind you, as Bob is talking, in here that if you have a specific question, go ahead and type your question in the go to meeting menu box and I will make sure to uh, that we address that with Bob here during the webinar here today. All right. So the first question, Bob, um, you know, one that has come up here quite a bit um, here for us internally has centered around the three duties test, or in what you had stated, the fourth, <laughs> four duties test. Um, so which one, is there one that, that their clients should be most concerned about or one that might cause the greatest maybe confusion or angst? My guess, my guess is that it's going to be the administrative exemption. Um, Employers like to hand out titles, and uh, they do that for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's purely organizational, but sometimes it gives employees a good sense of morale to have, have a title. But what, what employers need to know about the administrative exemption is that it's got to be non-manual office work. So if you're calling somebody out in the shop an administrator, uh, but he or she is, is actually doing manual labor as a substantial function of their job, that administrative exemption is is not going to uh, apply to them. Also, the employer needs to understand that somebody who they are seeking to use the title of administrator for as an exemption to FLSA, uh, FSLA, is, is that they have to have discretion or judgment in some area of the employer's business. Uh, so those two qualifications, along with the minimum wage, are the things that employers are going to have to look at carefully to determine whether or not the, the administrative exemption applies. Uh, probably the next more difficult one would be the executive exemption. Uh, again, people think of themselves as white collar or blue collar, and I think there are a lot of, of blue collar or white collar people who might not fall within the uh, the executive ex exemption. So again, some of the the, the things you have to tick off if you're if you're considering that as an exemption is whether or not the primary duty of the person is to manage other workers, and if it is, that person has to be managing at least two full-time or full-time equivalent employees for the exemption to uh, apply. Uh, the executive also has to have either the authority to hire, fire, discipline, promote, uh, or make other uh, job uh, function decisions, or that person at least has to have uh, significant input in, into those kinds of decisions. So if you have somebody that you're calling an executive, you know, vice president of sales, but that, that person uh, doesn't pick and, and choose who he's going to hire or fire as sales reps, you might have a, t a hard time uh, meeting the, the, uh, the exemption as a as a uh, an executive, so those are the two. I think you'll have the, the most employers will have the most difficulty with the professional exemption. Uh, is it, is generally pretty clear. They usually have some kind of professional certification or tr training, such as a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, an architect. But it can also apply to somebody in the creative arts. Uh, so em employers who use creative people uh, might want to consider whether or not that exemption would apply to them. 
And then uh, just briefly, the computer exemption, there's a, a fairly detailed list of duties that I'm not going to go into now because I think it's beyond the scope of, of, of this seminar, uh, that the computer person has to be doing in order to qualify. Somebody who just comes in and sets up your, your workstation is not going to qualify under the exemption. All right, great, great. Uh, there might be some additional details, folks, that we could send after this webinar that might provide some additional clarity on that specific exemption then. One of the questions, Bob, um, and this is, it's, it's certainly ties into our, our subject here today, uh, came from Carolyn. Um, how are folks accounting for the difference in, a say, a 37 and a half hour work week versus 40 hour work week? Um, do you have any recommendations that employers, uh, I mean, are they, are they supposed to change now to a 40 hour work week? Well, now employers do not have to change their work week, but what they do need to know is that a, an employee who works 40 hours a week has to meet the minimum wage and overtime standards if they are not exempt. But you don't, you don't have to have a 40-hour work week. If your employees are working 37 hours, then overtime doesn't come into play because you only have to pay overtime after 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And thanks for Carolyn for uh, sending in that question. Let's go to our next question here that we'll pose. Um, you know, many of the broker's clients, their employees, will have highly compensated employees in their mix. Um, what do they need to know to be most concerned about, I guess, in complying with the new threshold and these rules? Well, really, there, there are just two things. Um, first of all, they've got to meet the new test of $134,004 annual salary, and it's got to be a salary. You touched on earlier uh, some of the things that um, must be in play for there to be a salary, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, and the, the highly compensated person has to meet one of, of the duties tests. So those are the two tests. Now, in, in determining whether somebody has a salary, um, it's got to be a weekly or less frequent salary. Uh, it can't be, as you said earlier, um, reduced for uh, on the basis of quality or, or quantity. Uh, if somebody is out sick, you can't reduce it because they've missed a day of employment. In other words, if they work at all during the week um, and you're treating them as a highly compensated salaried employee, uh, if they if they work at all during the week, they are um, they get their full wage. There are some. Uh, I don't want to get overly technical, but there are some. Exemptions for that, if you have a sick plan and the sick plan is going to compensate them um, under, let's say, a disability insurance program at, at the rate uh, of, their, of their wage, uh, then you don't have to pay it directly if it's coming from insurance. So those are the kinds of things that employers are going to want to look at when they're dealing with highly compensated uh, employees. Great. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, it's always um, always difficult, you know, because I, I guess there's some, uh, there. I guess the threshold, like they they could be paid a variable, so as long as they are, what, under that threshold um, of the 47,000, but then have bonus that gets them up above the 134, like how does that come into the mix? You can use up to 10% of the threshold number, the 47,000 number, or roughly $4,700, to count toward the minimum wage. If it's mm -hmm. being paid pursuant to a, uh, a guaranteed bonus plan. Uh, and there are, there are safe harbors, for example, if it's based on, on sales and in one quarter you don't hit the sales number to, to pay the one quarter of the $4,700, you can make that up in a, set, in a subsequent quarter. But it's got to be a non-discretionary, essentially guaranteed, a bonus payment. Uh, okay. Let, that, let's kind of cover applies, that applies both for highly compensated uh, and um, any other employee meeting the, the test. The right. So let's make, let's maybe dig into that, I guess, just a little bit deeper here. You know, with this next question, um, at least in regard to kind of this bonus or incentive pay, and and how does that help them reach the new uh, white collar exemption? What can you provide or or assist with clients here, or make recommendations on how they can um, utilize this new um, kind of opportunity in using bonus or incentive pay? Well, they can. Uh, if they don't have one, they can adopt a non-discretionary 
uh, bonus plan, uh, and it can be based really on, on any criteria the employer wants to establish so long as it's reasonably likely that those criteria are going to be met. Uh, and the, the maximum that used for minimum wage purposes under that bonus plan is, is 10 percent of the 47,476 threshold. Uh, once you've paid that amount out under the bonus, anything further paid out under the bonus plan will not be uh, used to satisfy the minimum wage test. Okay. Great, great. Very, very good. You know, one of the questions that came in from uh, one of our um, listeners here today is uh, kind of centered around this question, so I've been kind of waiting for this one. And uh, Veronica asks, you know, so I have a salaried employee at 45000 a year. Oh, okay, what, what changes with them? So let's, let's go in here into our question here that we have uh, posed, because I think it'll, you'll provide some great insight here for her. So the new requirements will require employers to review their current exempt employee population. So doing what Veronica is saying here today, I've got an employee at 45000 What are my options? What's my choice, at least to kind of fulfill this uh, requirement? So what, what additional observations might you encourage brokers to recommend to their clients, or what of some of those options here on the next screen might make the most sense for employers to make? Well, the first thing that employers are going to have to do is, is just an analysis of their workforce. And the, the number that Veronica has, has given us is a, is a good number because it, it puts the, the questioning in very clear focus. If, if that employee generally does not work overtime, then it might make sense for the employer to simply reclassify the employee as non-exempt and continue to pay the $45,000 and not worry about uh, paying the higher number because that employer is not going to incur overtime. And, and just so people understand, this is not a minimum wage act revision. This, is, this does not increase the minimum wage. It only increases the minimum wage if you want to treat employees as exempt for overtime purposes. So that employee, the employer doesn't have to do anything with if that employee does not work substantially amount of overtime. On the other hand, if that employee does work a substantial amount of overtime such that at his or her hourly rate or hourly rate equivalent, the overtime would take them over the exempt amount, then rather than paying them as, as overtime, you might want to give that employee a bump in salary to take him or her up to the new exempt threshold and thereby continue to avoid paying overtime. And that simply is an analysis of the workforce, how many people are in that, that category, how much that's going to bump you up in terms of overall payroll versus what payroll will be if you don't bump them up and that, that employee then works an amount of overtime that takes them over the threshold and now you're paying them at a time and a half rate. The, sure second category of employee who is well below the new threshold, where it would not make sense to, to give a substantial raise to just to continue them as an exempt employee or create a new, new employee who is exempt. Uh, but there, what the employers really need to be thinking about is putting into place uh, two things. One, a very tight overtime policy that limits over time that is, that is approved in advance. You might want to even say approved in writing in advance. Uh, and then very good record keeping. Uh, I, I think a, a large area of problem for employees who are in that situation, employers who are in that situation, is going to be putting in place record keeping policies that have not been followed before that. It's going to be critical that employers keep good record keeping of time work and uh, if, if those time records don't already exist because the, the workforce is largely e exempt and now you're going to have a, a significant number of non-exempt employees, that putting in a, in, a, in a time management system can be very difficult for employees to, to get logged into. But that's going to be very critical, which is why employers need to be thinking about this now so that a good system, whether it's time cards, 
or uh, reporting into a manager, reporting out when you're not working. All of that is, is what employers are going to have to start dealing with when a significant segment of their workforce goes from exempt to non-exempt. Along with that is um, an understanding that if you have an employee who works overtime and does so without prior approval pursuant to a plan, you still have to pay that employee the overtime. You can't say, well, I didn't approve it, so therefore I'm not paying it. But what you, what employers can and should be doing is having a, a payroll plan and system that says, all right, I'm paying you for your overtime, but I'm, I'm giving you a day's leave without pay because you violated the policy of working overtime without uh, prior approval. And, and those, they've, they've got a, those kinds of policies have to be enforced. And then another major area where I think employees, uh, where employers are going to have to think things through carefully is the currently exempt employee who will become non-exempt who does routinely work from home. And such things as checking emails or text messages off the clock, that now becomes compensable time for a non-exempt employee. And employers either have to set up a mechanism whereby that time is captured for payroll purposes, or they have to tell employees, don't do it, and, and then again enforce that policy. Uh, <laughs> those are going to be, I think, difficult things. And there's a morale side of this. If you have employees who historically have thought of themselves as uh, th there's a cachet to being considered a, an exempt employee, or sometimes exempt employees are referred to as white collar employees, and now all of a sudden you're you're not. Uh, the employee is going to have a morale response to that. My, my advice to the, my clients has been, you know, blame it on the government. They're the ones who've done this. <laughs> so there is there is that. Employee sophisticated um, way employers can also on a one-time basis change the work week. So for example, if you have employees who are working 12-hour shifts for seven consecutive days, and then they have seven days off, and the work week is Monday through Sunday, you can adjust that work week one time, um, and you can avoid, uh, in some cases, up to uh, over 30 hours of overtime in that first week. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because it's, uh, A, you have to sit down very carefully and plan that out, but it, it's not the kind of thing that the Department of Labor likes. And you've got to be sure that if you're doing it, you're doing it in a way that it's not going to get you in trouble. So those, those I think, are the things that employers got to be facing as they go through this um, this change of, of the uh, minimum thresholds. Wow, yeah, that's some great recommendations. I mean, I think one of the things that I pulled out of, of what you stated was, you know, when a manager sends emails to that employee, and if that employee responds after hours at night over the weekend, I mean, in effect, that's compensatory. And, and you know, listen, that could apply to hours worked, and, um, you know, you, you potentially have some overtime, you know, issues there. So very, very interesting. One of the questions, and I think this is a kind of a, a questions from the audience that I think kind of just to confirm, you know, so based on the new requirement, say an employee has moved up to the new weekly uh, threshold, the exempt, okay, side of the threshold, and works over the 40 hours, the employer is not going to have to pay overtime, correct? I mean, if they fall under the exempt status, uh, they would not be required to pay overtime, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, another question here um, uh, is comes from Otis, and uh, you know, there's a lot of different <laughs> definitions out there that ACA, HHS, CMS, uh, Department of Labor, you know, they all have kind of varying different definitions. And the Affordable Care Act, which these benefit consultants are very much a part of, day in and day out, you know, it 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 tells you that you have to track employees through certain measurement periods and it refers to hours worked and even hours not worked uh, to account for um, whether that employee is working on average 30 hours or more over a given week or 130 hours or more in a given month. Um, in, in relation to the overtime requirement, is is that a factor or concern in determining overtime pay? Are, are we just looking at hours worked throughout that week or weekly pay period? With, 
that, that is not a factor for minimum wage and overtime requirements. It's a straight 40-hour work week. If, if in a work week the employee is working more than 40 hours then, and they are non-exempt, then for the hours over 40, they must be paid at a minimum of time and a half of what their normal hourly rate. Okay. And another question here from uh, from Otis was, you know, can employers who currently pay employees for or during time at lunch, or those types of, of scenarios, um, simply not pay for time at lunch to reduce the actual hours worked? Is there a way for them to get around it during those lunch hours? <laughs> well, Otis has Otis has asked a great question because earlier this week the Third Circuit Court of Appeals answered that question in a case involving uh, DuPont, and the answer is no. Uh, no, you cannot use time uh, paid for lunch or, or breaks to offset overtime pay. Uh, people should know that the, the Fair Labor Standards Act does not require employers to pay for a lunch hour um, or for break times. But if the employer decides to pay for the lunch hour, that pay for that hour cannot be used to offset an overtime obligation, at least in the Third Circuit Court, um, which covers Delaware, New, uh, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and Maryland, I do, I believe. Um, I suspect that, that that logic will be followed by other circuits, but certainly um, in, in this area, you cannot offset paid lunch against overtime. Okay, great. Great question, Otis. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our next question, kind of the next topic that we have for you, and it's really from the HR perspective. Um, brokers are often viewed as an advisor for many human resource types of functions and responsibilities, um, and this just adds uh, seemingly to it <laughs> to some degree as far as, well, from an HR perspective, are there some specific policies or procedures that their clients should be putting in place or at least taking some existing documentation and have those amended going forward, Bob? Well, uh, I, I alluded to some of them, and I don't know whether this is going to be done through HR or through uh, different operational arms of an employer, but certainly uh, a, the, you've got to go through the step of analyzing your workforce and deciding who you want to continue to treat as exempt and who going forward will be treated as non-exempt. And that is almost 100% a financial decision. I say almost 100% because, as I mentioned earlier, there are some morale issues here. And, and employers have to consider for valued employees <clears throat> what, if anything, they want to do by increasing wages just to, to keep good morale. But it, it, by and large, uh, and certainly a starting point for, for the analysis, is an, an examination of the workforce and a determination of, of who's going to be bumped up and who is not to, to continue exemptions. Uh, and then for those employees who historically have been exempt under the lower numbers and will now no longer be exempt, there has to be put in place a method uh, by which that time worked is captured in a uh, a form that can be documented to departments of labor, state and, and federal, for purposes of, of proving that you're satisfying minimum wage and overtime requirements. It, it also needs to be explained to managers that they are responsible for assuring that the new time system, whatever it might be, is adhered to. Uh, they've got to be checking on employees for some time into the future until it becomes, you know, commonplace and employees are doing it as a matter of rote. Uh, and, and managers have to have some responsibility for, for assuring that their employees are doing that. Employees have to be given an explanation as to why all of a sudden you have to document your time down to the minute. Uh, you know, why if you're reading emails at home, you either can't do that because you're working 40 hours in the office, or if you're doing it, you're, uh, you're keeping a record of it. Uh, employers will also have to be weary of when employees who are now non-exempt and who were previously exempt are traveling, whether travel time now 
is a, a paid time or not. Typically, an employee is not considered um, working from the trip from the home to the office and from the office home. But travel during the day between points uh, on behalf of the employer, that time is considered compensable. Uh, then, and those rules can get pretty hairy depending on, on what's going on. Uh, there's a, a, a whole line of litigation for donning and doffing uh, clothes. Typically, those are people who are um, under the minimum wage who probably would not be considered exempt anyway, but, but you can have a highly paid skilled workforce where uh, you have donning and doffing issues, whether that time is compensable or not compensable. You can have required company meetings where the manager says, I want everybody here Monday morning an hour early so I can go over some new policies. Is, is that hour compensable or not? And there are you know, legions of cases that, dis, that, that give employers some guidance as to whether those kinds of meetings need to be calculated into the 40 hours for overtime purposes. So I think these are the kinds of things that HR departments or whatever department or departments are responsible for um, wage thresholds are going to have to give a lot of thought to. Very good. You know, Bob, one of the things that you did, um, you know, express here is the ability for the employer to record, like record keeping. That activity is very important. And one of the questions um, from the listeners here today from Pamela is kind of centered around that. And just, um, you know, so this new rule starts here as of December 1st. Uh, this employer pays semi-monthly. So is the employer supposed to begin with kind of this record keeping starting 12-1? 2016 Absolutely. to be compliant? Absolutely, because on on 12-7 or 12-5 maybe, I don't know what I don't know what day of the of the week December begins on, but <laughs> right, by right. that by that seventh work day, or actually the seventh day of the, of the calendar, uh, you're gonna have to pay a certain wage. And you've got to know whether or not a newly non exempt employee has worked more than forty hours. So absolutely, this has got to be in place by December 1st. Right. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Let's go ahead and move um, to, we just have a couple more questions, but getting some good ones here from the audience as well. Um, you know, I, just thinking about dangers, and you've kind of, you have certainly hinted on some of these. I think there's, uh, you know, whether we're using the right word, you know, there's consequences, right, uh, for fulfilling the requirements or not fulfilling uh, these requirements. Um, but what do you feel, I guess, are the greatest pitfalls or dangers that you see impacting employers complying with these new requirements? Well, I, I'm, I'm convinced there's going to be a large group of employers who are simply going to ignore these, these new regs. Uh, and they're going to do so at their peril. There are a great number of plaintiff's lawyers out there who are taking these cases on and taking them on as, on a class basis. And what employers need to understand is that if you, if you are found to have violated uh, the minimum wage requirements, the employee gets not only the minimum wage, but liquidated damages and attorney's fees. And the, and the liquidated damages are equal to the amount owed. So if you're found to have, you know, 200 employees and you owe each employee a thousand dollars, now you're up to four hundred thousand dollars in in damages and liquidated damages. Plus, you then have to pay their attorney their fees, your attorney your fees, and one more thing, you can't settle these lawsuits privately. Uh, a wage and hour lawsuit can only be uh, effectively settled with the approval of either a federal court or the uh, United States Department of Labor. So once you are in that arena, you now have a Department of Labor who's going to come in and say, let's, let's take a deeper look at what you've been doing. And what might have started out as a relatively simple lawsuit, um, you, you might find after an investigation of the, by the Department of Labor that you have a much more serious problem. And employers should know that there are certain individuals within a corporate employer 
who can have personal liability for these wages. Uh, the person responsible for assuring the payment of wages uh, can be nailed individually when the wages aren't paid. So that's, that's certainly a, a huge pitfall. Hmm. And, and as you said, I've alluded to the other things. You know, record keeping is going to be key here and explaining to people you no longer can work overtime unless you get approval, it, that's a change of a, of, a, of a work ethos. And somebody who's used to going home and you know, writing up the, the, uh, the schedule for tomorrow's production at home while he's watching the news, uh, he's going to have to find some other time to do that or you're going to have to be paying him overtime. So it's not just altering somebody's work schedule. It's finding a way of getting that same amount of work done during what could be a substantially uh, reduced uh, work week. If you have if you have an employee who's putting in 40 hours at the at the let's say a production manager, and he's putting in 40 hours uh, in in the the plant, and then he goes home and spends an hour and a half every night uh, doing doing his production schedule for the next day. Well, you now have seven and a half hours of overtime every week, and you multiply that by several employees doing it, and you can see that you can very quickly uh, run up a, a much more significant payroll than you thought you had. Very good. Um, well, we have, um, just with time here, I've got a few more questions from the audience, and I'd like to, to maybe uh, go after those here a little bit, Bob. Um, so we'll maybe rapid fire some of these here a little bit. Some are more simple uh, questions and others maybe not. Um, Otis did provide a, just a kind of a, a, an additional question to his question earlier about, you know, paying using lunch time as hours worked. And Otis uh, had just asked the question, can the employer simply change its policy and not pay uh, for time at or during lunch? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Simple answer. That's, that's the, what I thought. The Act does not, require, the act does not yeah. require employers to pay for lunch. <laughs> Fantastic. However, Fantastic. Let, me, let me give Otis a caveat. Yes. If you are going to not pay for the lunch hour, that employee cannot be doing any work during the lunch hour. So if you have a lunch room, and you have a, a secretary or a paralegal who's at lunch, don't go running in and say, hey, um, where's this? Or can you, can you do a quick letter for me? Or answer my phones while I use the men's room. Uh, if, they're, if they're an unpaid lunch, then they need to be not doing work. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, very good point. A question from David uh, is centered around highly compensated employees. Um, can, um, let's see here, uh, let's see. So if, if a HCE, a highly compensated employee, if they make over $134,004, they are exempt no matter what their role is. Would you say that that's accurate? Uh, no. They, they still have to meet one of the duties tests mm -hmm. that we discussed earlier. So it's, yep, it's very still good. a, a two-pronged test. Yeah, so not all three uh, there, David, but just the one uh, test, at least one of those tests they must pass. Um, Gar um, asked the question, and just to confirm, you know, if I had an employee being paid over $47,476 as salary, they're exempt for overtime. Is that correct? Yes. All right, very good. That, all right, that awesome. employee, you don't need to worry about. Right, okay. Um, Okay, so this question comes from Cheryl, uh, stating, we have employees who are paid a salary. Uh, my question box moved here. Hang on a second. <laughs> so I can read that. We, uh, let, me, let me start again. Uh, we have employees who are paid a salary biweekly that is under the threshold but receive commission monthly that may or may not take them over that amount. How would overtime be calculated? The scenario if all pay must be considered when calculating overtime? It's, I guess the question is, are the commissions guaranteed or are they subject to sales? And okay. the answer will dif differ depending on whether those are guaranteed commissions, which generally commissions are not guaranteed, but I have seen some where they are. <coughs> Excuse me, the fundamental the fundamental issue is uh, whether the the outside salesperson is even covered by the act. So 
you, you can have outside salespeople who are not covered by the act and the first, the first test will be to see what is that salesperson doing and are they, are they covered by the act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very, very good. So Cheryl, maybe some more digging there, uh, but um, that was some good information there, Bob, that Cheryl can take, uh, take back uh, to her team. Um, Kim asked a question here in regard to um, kind of that, you know, this employee just kind of goes home at night over the weekend and they're working, <laughs> okay? And so Kim asks, you know, if an employee chooses to take something home and work on it, you know, like while watching TV, you know, as you gave as an example, does overtime still need to be paid? So, and, and even though the employer is not asking that employee to do work at home, uh, maybe that employee is just wanting to catch up on something. How do you respond to that in regard to this requirement? There, there, there's no such thing as, as volunteering to do work for your employer in an unpaid capacity, unfortunately, um, <laughs> unless unless you happen to be a nonprofit, and, and there are some squirrely issues there too. No, if the employee is working at home, they have to be um, they have to be compensated for that time, and you have to tell them they can't volunteer. If you don't want to pay them overtime, um, you you this goes back to my saying you need to educate managers and employees. They have to be educated as to what they may not do so that you, the employer, are not caught up in this overtime trap because, you know, the employee will go home and, and do a couple of hours of volunteer work and they'll do that for months or years and then all of a sudden you'll have a falling out with that and she's at a cocktail party and mentions it to some a plaintiff lawyer, he says, oh, wait a minute, you've got a great case for all that volunteer time. So, no, there's no, no right of the employee, and, and they should be advised that they, they cannot do, quote, volunteer work um, seemingly off the clock. And, uh, Steve, if I could just go back to the prior question, because right? I don't, I, I don't want to leave the questioner hanging too much. There is an outside sales exemption under, under the Act, which we, we didn't talk about, but just, just so that questioner is aware, for that exemption to apply, the primary duty of the employee must be making sales. And, and under the, the uh, FLSA, there's a definition that I'm not going to go into, but, but what that means in terms of outside sales, um, mm -hmm. or obtaining orders for contracts for services or, uh, or goods. And it's got to be outside of the employer's facility primarily. And mm -hmm. the, the salesperson customarily must work away from the employer's place of business. So if, if those tests are met, well, the act does not apply to outside salespeople. All right. Thank you, Bob, uh, for that clarification. And Kim, thank you for that question there earlier. I'm going to have just one more question here, Bob, from the audience, um, from Cheryl. This will be the last one we take here today. And her question is, um, if two people within their company perform the same type of a job and have been considered exempt up to now, but one will be over the threshold and one will not. Is it okay to require one to keep their work week at 40 hours and require the other to continue to work a schedule that has been over 40 hours? Within the context of, of this act, the answer to the question is yes. But as an employment lawyer, my antenna go up and I ask, what is the difference between those two employees such that one is working over time and one is not, and do you have issues of some form of, of discrimination? So the, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act does not preclude you from doing that, but there might be other issues that arise in that context. Okay. Great. Thank you. And it was a great, great question there. Um, if we're unable here to get to everyone, um, you know, there's just a few others here, um, but for sake of time here, we will get back to you here um, offline. And uh, Bob, just as we kind of wrap some things up, I've got just a couple here, but, um, you know, is there anything that just jumps out? Um, I've heard so much to this, different types of um, situations and circumstances and such, but th would there be a recommendation as a best practice for employers as they prepare for this deadline, other than start now <laughs> to prepare? Uh, yeah, my advice would be start two months ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, yeah, you know, we're, we're getting really up against it, and employers who have a significantly sized workforce, I mean, if you've got five employees or ten employees, 
you know, you can do that analysis very fairly quickly. But if you have, if you've got a lot of employees, and and a lot of those employees are in this gray area of they're now exempt, but they won't be exempt under the new rules. You have to, for each individual employee, make some assessment as to how you want to treat that employee, whether you're going to bump the salary up or, or keep them the same and pay overtime. Are you going to keep the salary the same, preclude overtime, and hire additional employees so that all the work gets done at straight time? Uh, if you're going to do that, what are the, what are the added benefit costs that you'll, you'll incur by taking on new employees. Um, that, that's a, you know, an area that we didn't discuss. Employees who were exempt, who now become non-exempt, uh, in addition to overtime issues and, and, and premium pay for overtime, will those employees lose any benefits? Uh, some benefits are, are described or defined by whether an employee is an exempt or non-exempt employee. Typically, it's not things like, like medical insurance uh, or ERISA-type plans, but you might, you might have employers who say that their exempt employees get um, 20 days PTO, pay time off, and non-exempt employees don't get that. Well, now you have an employee who, for low these many years, has been exempt under the old or the current wage thresholds, and now, on December 1st, that employee is no longer going to be exempt. What are you going to do about that employee? Are you going to cut that benefit, or are you going to change how you're going to um, apply that benefit? One alternative to just cutting that employee off <clears throat> is to change your, your PTO policy to gradually give people PTO or additional PTO based on tenure with the company, regardless of whether they're exempt or non-exempt. So these are the kinds of things that employers have to think through carefully as they um, decide what they're going to do with these new regs. Very good, Bob. There's a lot to digest here in just this uh, short hour. Um, just in the final kind of final slides that I have here, folks, and I wanted to put this up here while Bob was talking because it, you know, again, this doesn't make it easy. There's only five things to do, right? But steps one through four really are centered around what your clients need to be working on in complying here right now. I mean, there's clear action items that they need to take. Uh, as Bob has mentioned, the identification of employees here today, you know, who, who will be? non-exempt. I mean, what? who does this impact here today? Um, then you've got to do the step two and three, right? Determine those costs. Look at the options. What are we going to do? Are we raising their salary? Are we going to pay them overtime? You know, what do we want to do here with each of those employees? Because each employee is an individual is it's it, the, the your decision is going to be um, impacted differently and separately for each employee that it might affect. So analyze the cost of each of those options and really determine the best case forward for each unique individual and employee. But then you got to begin to communicate, right? Managers need to understand if they're going to be utilizing a new record keeping system or employees that will now need to be, uh, you know, uh, tracked for hours worked and so forth. You know, you need to begin to communicate these exchanges, uh, these changes to managers and certainly those employees here right now. And then lastly, you know, hitting December 1st, you know, <laughs> you, you know, policy should have been in place, but now you're really um, activating those policies and, and ensuring that you're implementing those specific changes. You know, the, it, it is, um, to some degree, what we've talked a lot about today is certainly getting in compliance, um, but starting December 1st, you know, your clients are going to need to stay in compliance. And Bob has kind of talked, um, you know, uh, very importantly about um, just the active record keeping and and when you think about it the FLSA uh, requires that employers keep certain records to ensure that workers get paid the wages they earn and are owed, right? But but the FLSA has not made any requirement as to, hey, you have employer, you have to use this particular tool or um, system in order to track it. They're just saying, look, you, I'm going to leave it up to you, employer, to choose the method that works best for you, you know, based on the needs of your workforce. But you're going to want to truly try to consider with a 
lot of the record keeping systems and options that are out there today, employers are going to want to try to automate these tracking and reporting capabilities as part of their employee scheduling and record keeping or time and attendance types of, of duties that will be needed. You know, Prime Pay, as a payroll company, um, we certainly are, are able and willing to talk to you, talk to your clients about what specific options are available in that space to uh, better provide a more automated, efficient tracking and reporting capability um, for your clients. So with that, Thank you um, for listening here today. There were a couple other questions um, that were asked, Bob. We were unable to get to it here today. I appreciate your um, uh, response, the experience, um, the knowledge that you have provided today. It gave some, some excellent practical application to how brokers can communicate this specific um, and major obligation here to their employers. Uh, so thank you, Bob, um, for um, speaking with us here today. Uh, as follow-up folks, Thank you, Bob. As far as the follow-up, look for a follow-up webinar follow-up from us here in uh, another day or so. We will provide the link to the recording. Um, we will be providing a brand new overtime overhaul flyer that we have created that, that will help you as you talk with your clients. And then exclusive to our BC partners, uh, you will also have the opportunity to receive our slide deck and also a more comprehensive ebook um, on understanding the overtime, uh, these new rules. Um, and please join us um, for our next webinar, which will actually be our last webinar uh, for the year, which will be held Wednesday, November 2nd, and look for more details on that very, very soon. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, we wish you a, a successful and very busy uh, fourth quarter here of the year, but uh, wish you the best and look forward to your attendance to our webinar here next month. Have a great day, and that will conclude our webinar.